Um, we are going now to our second plenary session um, where we will think, uh, where we will turn our attentions to cities. Cities uh, which Mayor Bor Boris Johnson of London has described as the single most brilliant um, invention of our species. What we all know in the work that we do is that cities are where global mobility stops being an abstract idea and becomes lived experience. So to help us explore that lead what leadership means in today's um, hyper-diverse cities, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel of city leaders. Please join me in welcoming our mayor's panel to the stage. Uh, we have with us today Mayor Olaf Scholz. Mayor, Mayor Yussi Pajun from Helsinki. <laughs> and Councillor Raquel uh, Castaneda Lopez of Detroit. Also joining us today is our guest moderator, Melinda Crane. I'm truly delighted to welcome Melinda to the podium. Melinda is chief political correspondent at Deutsche Welle and host of the talk show Quadriga and the political magazine People and Politics. And Melinda is above all an old friend. In 2010, Melinda moderated the mayor's panel at the first International Cities of Migration Conference in The Hague. So please welcome Melinda Crane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, for those kind opening remarks. And uh, thank you very much to Khalid Kozar for setting the stage for us. Guten Tag, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, and dear friends from Maitri, Bertelsmann, Mercator, and of course from the Bill Stiftung. It's a very great pleasure to be back at Cities of Migration. As Kim mentioned, I was uh, at Cities of Migra Migration last time around, and I'm truly very, very happy to be here once again. Before we begin, I would like to get a show of hands to just get a sense where we are all from. So please tell me who amongst you is from Berlin? Okay, and from Germany? Keep those hands up. Okay, very good. How about Europe in general? North America? <laughs> Asia? Uh huh. And Africa? Okay, very, very good, thank you. And now just one last question. Who else is an alumnus? Who joined us for the last Cities of Migration conference in 2010? Did I forget South America? We need to do South America first. Put those hands down, please. South America? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that reminder. And now, Cities of, of Migration 2010, who was there last time around? Great, so some repeaters, but uh, not all that many. So I would have had a bit of a hard time answering those questions that I just posed, uh, or uh, I would have had to do, as many of you did, vote several times, because I am from North America, but I live in Germany. In other words, I am a migrant. And those of us who are migrants know that we have many overlapping identities and in fact often have to raise our hands uh, a number of times around. More people than ever before are living abroad. The number that I found was 232 million people in the world, international migrants, but perhaps the experts in the audience have different numbers there. The fact is, many migrants do head toward cities. The overwhelming majority of migrants settle in urban areas Local governments have a number of levers for influencing inclusive prosperity. That, of course, is our subject, an agenda for shared prosperity. But many, many cities are facing challenges. Some of the cities represented here today are only now developing policies because they've only recently become receiving destinations. Others are revising long-standing approaches, perhaps in part because of disappointing results and or changing patterns. But the fact is, whichever group you fall into, leadership is absolutely key because the influence of a, mayor's, of a mayor and of council members remains a very, very powerful tool. 
And that's why we begin today with a panel of very progressive municipal leaders to talk about what can be done. Halit Koza asked us to get concrete, to really talk about best practices, to share examples and try to learn from each other, and that's exactly what we want to do now on our panel. And I'm very pleased now to introduce, to say a few more words about our panelists, starting with Raquel Castaneda Lopez. She is a Detroit City Council member representing District 6, which is home to the majority of Detroit's immigrant communities. She is the first Latina ever to serve in this position. She's a social worker by training and has over 10 years of experience in youth programming for marginalized communities. And she founded and currently co-chairs Detroit's Immigration Task Force. And I'll just save time by saying we're going to clap hard again at the end, but we're awfully glad to have you with us, Raquel. Sitting next to Raquel is Yussi Payunen. He has been the mayor of Helsinki since 2005. Under his leadership, the city has been developing as a global business hub, so we'll be hoping to hear from you about the role of the private sector, and also as a center of knowledge. And before assuming his duties as mayor, he, Mr. Payunin served on the city council and also worked as managing director and chairman of the board of his family firm, Edvard Payunin Limited. And on my right, Olaf Scholz, known to all of the Germans in the audience and undoubtedly many others, as well as the first mayor of the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg and as president of the Hamburg Senate. He is a former federal labor minister and also a former member of the German parliament, the Bundestag, and he's had a very long, illustrious career in Germany's Social Democratic Party, serving as chairman of the Hamburg SPD and as secretary general of the SPD Germany. And I would like to direct my first question to you, Mayor Scholz. I'd like to start out by asking each of you to take us on a tour and tell us about the particular experiences and challenges you're facing right now. Hamburg, of course, is a wealth creator. Your average GDP, your average growth, significantly better than in many other cities in Germany, certainly better than in the one we are sitting in at the moment. Um, <laughs> not surprisingly, that does attract an increasing number of migrants. Nearly a third of Hamburg's residents have a migration background at the moment. Tell us what challenges you are facing today. I think it's very important to, to discuss about the numbers, that nearly 500,000 of the in inhabitants of the city are migrants. And so it is quite important that we have a good plan about what to do. I think one of the most important things is to have an idea about uh, participation. And this is why we started a very, very strong naturalization campaign. We found out that uh, nearly half of all the 500,000 already are Germans besides another citizenship they may have. And uh, that the other half is uh, quite important because half of them could get the German citizenship if they would request for it. And this is why I write, write letters personally to any of the now 140,000 uh, men and women in Hamburg who could get the German citizenship and ask them to do so. And uh, this had a very, very big effect in the last year, we had more than 7,000 7, people getting the German citizenship in Hamburg, and this is the biggest number of one of the 16 states in Germany. It is much more than double the number we had in 2009, and it's increasingly supported by the people, and they are really happy that the mayor is writing a letter to them and asks them to, get, to become a German. And uh, it, it is something many waited for for, for de decades. And uh, so I think it will have a big inf effect on the uh, situation of the city, on the debates we have together, and of the identity the people have. The second biggest thing is that we accept what they learned abroad. So we worked as, as the first of the 16 states in Germany on a recognition act, which makes it possible to, to use the qualifications you have got somewhere in the world. And this is much more important in Germany than in many other places, because if you don't have a paper, which uh, is a license to work, you, you will have big difficulties to, to get a job. And so it's important to have something like this. The third thing is that we are working very hard on, uh, on education. So we have uh, childcare for anyone now. We have all day childcare for all those who want it. We have, uh, all day 
schools, which is something special in Germany for the primary school and the secondary schools. Uh, any school, nearly any school now has these uh, opportunities. And uh, we are working very hard that it is free of charge. So we will reduce the charge for, 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 for nursery and for, for childcare. We never had charges for the schools, as, as uh, one has to explain in an international auditorium. And we put off the charges for university to give all those who want to attend uh, education a chance to, to be successful with this. And I think this is of big importance if you are a migrant city with 500 people coming from somewhere. It's ne necessary that you do a lot about uh, education and all the chances which are important for the people. And uh, one of the last things I would like to mention, I could continue for a very long time, but... We'll come of, back to a yeah, number yeah. of the issues you've raised. Uh, one so. of the last thing I would like to, to, to mention is uh, that we have a welcome center which uh, supports those coming from abroad to get uh, integrated in the city. So that's not only the several offices you can go to to get your support, but there is a special office where they are supporting you to get uh, all the necessary licenses, the, the, the permits which you are requesting for, and they help you finding your way through the city. And this is very successful. Thank you very much. We will, as I said, come back to a number of those points uh, a little bit later in the discussion, including uh, educational initiatives. Let me go now to Helsinki. It is a relatively new city of migration. After the end of the Cold War, and especially after accession to the European Union, your country saw a very sharp rise in new arrivals from abroad, many of them going to Helsinki. One number that I saw, 2% of Helsinki residents of foreign origin in 1989 compared to 11% today, so that is a significant increase. What are you doing to integrate them into a culture that for a long time was very, very homogenous? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, the information you gave or the statistic you gave about the city of Helsinki, it's, it's true that in 1990 we had only 2% of the population with migration, migrating background. Uh, actually, the figure for today is 13%, and what we are expecting in 15 years' time is something like 25 to 30%. And what does that mean to a city? Uh, the basic figures about the city of Helsinki that we have in the municipality, we have 600,000 people. The region is 1.4 million people. What that increase means to the city in, in which there is also an other population trend with, with the, which is very important, that is the aging of the population. The migration, migrate, immigrant population with immigrant background and, and the popul aging population, it's something which creates a, a, a huge challenge for society. What we are doing, number one, first, it, it is, is that we try to learn. Because we feel that we are coming later to, the, to, to this development and, and uh, internationally there are a lot of ex examples from which we, we can learn. That's why it's so important I'm here, here to listen what, what you are telling to us. The second thing is that I feel that the, the Helsinki and Finland are part of the Nordic community. We have a, a basic uh, things which are, are very positive. We have the Nordic system. Our education system is very egalitarian, and uh, I feel it's very good also. And, and then uh, we, we have a policy of social mixing in our housing areas. We don't have very, very much segregated housing areas. We have, uh, in our schools, we have a system for positive discrimination. They, they are a good basis for, for the new phenomenon of, of immigrant population. But then we have problems also. We have problems. Number one problem is in unemployment by far. But when, when trying to understand the phenomenon is, uh, I, I must tell you, I, I want to tell you about the, the division of, of uh, immigrant background. I, I like to use the expression that we have a half and half situation. The first half of the immigrant population comes from the neighborhood. And they are people who are speaking Estonian or Russia. 
and actually they integrate very fast to the society. But the second half is, is uh, more challenging for the society. They are coming from further away and their unemployment rate is very high. At the moment, the unemployment rate for the whole population, migrant population is, one could say, 2.5, even three points, uh, th three times higher than in the basic population. And what we are doing, we are working with the unemployment a lot. Maybe we go further in the, in the details, in the discussions. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to mention is that, that uh, the reason for unemployment is mostly the reason of the society, how we are working with the unemployment. And finally, I would like to tell one example of how we, we want to show to the, to the immigrant population and the whole society that everyone is well accepted. Like, uh, the, like in, in Hamburg, we have an information center at the city hall, in the center of the city, city hall, which is open seven days a week. And when you enter to the city hall, there, is, there are expositions, there are a lot of events in the, in the city hall, but first thing you notice is the information center for immigrants. And that's how we want to show for the whole people that immigrants are a positive source of vit vitality for the whole, whole city and society. Thank you very much. I would like to... <laughs> I would like to move now to Detroit. Many people, of course, had given up Detroit as all but lost after its bankruptcy, but the gover uh, governor of Michigan says that immigration can be the thing that pulls Detroit back from the brink, and he is proposing to attract 50,000 migrants over five years using a visa program for people with advanced degrees. I'd like to ask you, Ms. Castaneda Lopez, is that not unfair to the many, many unemployed people in Detroit, 30% of Detroit residents who do not have jobs? Sure. So just to paint the, the picture of what it looks like right now in the city of Detroit, um, we are still in bankruptcy. Uh, and so we haven't yet finished officially fi uh, filed our plan of adjustment. Uh, we just finished budget talks actually the day before I left. And that will go on pretty much through September, October. So the unemployment rate is incredibly high in the city of Detroit. Um, but I think the question isn't so much about the fairness of attracting uh, immigrants, but really how we define skilled labor. So we know that immigrants uh, open businesses at three times the rate that native native uh, Detroiters or Michiganders or even American citizens do. Um, and they employ uh, about five to seven uh, US citizens. And they tend to open up small shops in neighborhoods in the area where I live, Southwest Detroit, uh, large Latino community. And and it's really one of the communities that's remained stable, uh, primarily due to the influx, uh, well, the continual flow of immigrants in that area. Um, and so it's it's the only part that's actually growing in terms of population in the city of Detroit. Um, in relation to, to how we define skilled labor, I think that's the real that's the real issue here. So th the city of Detroit has lost uh, a lot of people. We could stand to add an additional 50,000 immigrants in the city. Um, however, I think it's looking critically and more comprehensively at uh, skilled labor. Oftentimes we think of the STEM fields, um, but Michigan is the second larger producer uh, of agricultural products in the country, second only to California. Um, and so we need skilled laborers like agricultural workers, but oftentimes that doesn't fall into the definition of STEM, of, of advanced degrees, um, also within the construction industries. My father, my family's from Mexico, and my father was a plasterer, and that was a skill that took him his entire life to develop. Um, and you'd be hard pressed to find a plasterer now, um, at least in Michigan, or in other parts of the United States that have that skill set. Um, and so I think it's looking critically at what it means to be a skilled employer, employee and and thinking more com comprehensively as we seek to attract immigrants to the city of Detroit um, and making sure that we're not uh, gentrifying communities and not displacing people in that process. And so on the, the immigration task force that I co-chair, we're partnering with the mayor's office as well as with the governor's office to make sure that there really is a comprehensive approach that looks at social services, that looks at education, looks at different quality of life issues, addresses uh, profiling and discrimination and immigrant rights in addition to supporting um, new immigrants coming over to the city of Detroit. Thank you very much. I would like to come back to 
the naturalization program, but perhaps in the context of a broader question about how we change perceptions of immigration. There is, for example, a very widespread perception here in Europe of low-skilled immigration as being a net fiscal burden to receiving countries and cities. I'm thinking, of course, about the debate that we've been having in Europe since the opening of labor markets to Romanian and Bulgarian migrants, people saying, look, they're only going to be drawing pensions here to be drawing welfare checks, and we cannot afford that. How do you change those kind of perceptions? And is such migration a net fiscal burden? Most of the statistics say no, but what's your impression, Mayor Scholz? Most of the people coming from other places in Europe using the free mobility we have for labor in, in Europe now um, are very fast integrated into jobs. So they are working and they are skilled. This is the numbers we know, and this is the case in Hamburg as in many other places. There are some others, and it is necessary also to speak about the problems coming from that. But this is uh, just another question, and if we look overview, have a good overview, we will understand that most of the people coming have good skills and will have good opportunities to, to find a job. I think it's necessary to understand that some, something changed in Europe. There's 500 million people living in, in a way, one state. And there is a free labor movement in Europe. This is the case in the United States. Anyone is used to it in, in the United States. And if someone is not successful in, uh, in, in Michigan or Illinois, he will look for a place in, in California or, 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 or somewhere else. And anyone thinks this is something that could happen. This is not the case in Europe so far, but it's changing because uh, due to the economic crisis in some of the southern parts of Europe, many young people especially are looking for better places. And this will change the societies we live in because I think the fact that there not anyone is speaking the same language in Europe is not that important because it's the people are able to, to, to learn another language and it's nothing they are afraid of really. So I think the, the culture is changing, the people will come, and this will uh, intensify the development we, had, we heard about in the beginning with the uh, first speeches, because um, now we have uh, expectations how our, our cities will grow. The people tell us uh, we will have a po possibly two million people in Hamburg in the end of the 20s, but then no one knows exactly because we are just counting the numbers learning from the past, but no one knows what will happen in an open labor market in Europe. And I think the big cities will grow even faster than we could expect. So it's necessary that we, very, we are very aware of the necessities and of the opportunities. And I think the dynamism of big cities as Hamburg and other places is that it's, they always have been places from people coming from all over the world and looking for a better life for themselves and their families and who are really eager to work, and uh, if they are with this culture, they will do. Briefly, if you would please, just the point about the naturalization program. To what extent is it changing perceptions, both among migrants who have now been addressed by you personally with a letter encouraging them to seek naturalization, but also among Hamburger in general? Are they seeing immigration in a different way in the course of the naturalization program, or is that one of your aims, at least longer term? I think it should be something like a state aim to, uh, to ask people who are coming to your country that uh, when they live there for a certain time that they request for the, for the citizenship of the state. So I always look for the United States and said they have a complete different culture of migration than we had in Europe. But we have to learn from them. And it, if someone goes to the United States, he wants to get a working permit, he wants to have his family there, he wants to have good schools for the the children, and he wants to get the, the American citizenship as fast as possible. When we started with migration in the 60s and 70s in Germany and other places, it was absolutely different. Anyone thought they will go, and those who came thought they will go. But this did not uh, turn out, and so we have to change the idea. I found out that when I announced my program of writing a letter and uh, inviting the, the people to get the uh, citizenship of Germany, no one opposed it. So there was mm. no nothing like a racial debate or something like this. Anyone supported it, and now anyone is proud of it because we are doing it in a very certain way. The migrants get the letter, 
and they are very happy that the mayor is writing to them personally. Once in the street, someone asked me, you wrote a letter to me. How did you get my address? <laughs> How did you know me? <laughs> yes, uh, so I, uh, I, I, I jumped to him because I couldn't tell him that this is absolutely to, to any uh, nece legal necessities. I don't know his address, but I write personally. So, uh, and, um, and then we have a big uh, meeting in the town hall, which is nearly the nicest place in the city, with, which, is, uh, which is giving big respect. And we are doing it with uh, many, many people coming there with their families, with their best clothes. And it is a, a big moment in their life. And I always have a speech there. And uh, we have uh, some children singing. And in the end, anyone is singing the anthem of the city-state of Hamburg <laughs> and of the Federal Republic of Germany. <laughs> and anyone is uh, really happy. And it always ends um, with me staying there for one hour or more and uh, taking photos with all the families. Very, very nice. Sounds practically self-evident to those of us who are from North America, but in fact, after 30 years in Germany, I cannot imagine de describing myself as an American German with a hyphen in the middle. It's, uh, it is quite a new approach for Germany. Let me talk a little bit more with uh, all of you about initiatives to integrate less skilled migrants. And I was intrigued, Mayor Payunen, both of you, by the way, mentioned your welcoming portals within your city halls, your real welcoming portals, as it were, but you also, Helsinki and Hamburg, have very impressive virtual portals. And on one of those portals, I was very intrigued to see, Mayor Payunen, that you couple social welfare assistance to migrants with a personalized, individualized integration plan. Can you tell us something more about that? Yes, uh, that, that is, uh, there are many words I, I could use about the one, one thing I, I like to call it is, we, or we have a youth guarantee. And then we have a system for, for skilled uh, people with immigrant background which is a bit different uh, target group, but the system functions similarly. That we, feel we want to take every person as an individual, create a path for education or employment uh, personally for that person. And for that we have a, I like to call it a one-stop one shop for, 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 the, for the service. We have mentoring or even guidance for, for that person. How, and how it functions is it functions that the person comes, comes to the center, gets a, a, a mentor or a, guide, a person who guides. They together try to find the education path, employment. But that's, that's not the end of the process. We are following with the person when, when he or she starts the education, what happens instead if there are problems he or she is able to come back and, and ask that, could we think something new? And this is the process how, how when we, we, we try to create a system that we, we are able to say that we guarantee that there is a path for the society for that person. And nowadays we are doing it especially for the young people. Uh, the reason, of course, is that the that uh, the young, younger generation is, uh, the exclusion in the youngest generation is, is the highest among the, the immigrant population. Uh, but uh, that's a system I believe very much. It's, uh, we, we have started uh, almost two years ago with, with the new program. Uh, the uh, preliminary and the first results are very positive. But uh, I think it's something I would like to talk with you also because uh, it's a system uh, which is, is enab enabled by the new, new digital system about the, the, the means of knowing who the people are and, and uh, what, what is the information. We get the information, and so, but always we need a person to talk to another person and not rely on too much on the, on the ICT systems. Ms. Castaneda Lopez, share with us, if you would, please, Detroit's experience in trying to promote educational opportunities 
and of course employment opportunities as well for migrants given that very, very high unemployment figure in Detroit, what can you do? Sure. So um, although I believe we're the eighth largest city in the in the country, unfortunately, I think we rank 135th in terms of the immigrant, the size of the immigrant population. And really, um, services for the immigrant community have been relatively non-existent. It hasn't really been a part of the conversation. And um, when we started the Immigration Task Force, it's very new, so I'm very excited to learn a lot at this conference. It's only been existence for a, a couple months, but there was a lot of people working independently around different I issues in the region. And so... A lot of the initiatives that the two mayors are talking about are things that we hope to put in place to address uh, educational attainment as well as employment opportunities. Um, but the city of Detroit is, is going through a difficult transition. I wish we had free quality education at all levels. Unfortunately, we struggle with that in the United States. Um, and the city is bankrupt. And so our hope is to implement the virtual office first because that's much more affordable for us as a city uh, versus uh, setting up an actual office. But that's definitely the long-term goal. Um, the governor announced the, the EB2, EB5 visa initiative, which is to attract uh, foreign investors that will invest at a million dollars or more and hire 10 or more employees. Uh, and the EB2 visa is to uh, target specifically highly skilled uh, workers. And so we were approved federally for the EB5 visa program and now have a site set up in the state of Michigan to attract foreign investors. And that's part of the strategy that the governor is employing at the state level uh, to address unemployment within the the city of Detroit. Uh, but unfortunately, the education piece kind of fall continues to fall off the radar. Um, and on council, what we're trying to do within just the city boundaries is to learn is to try to build stronger partnerships with several of the corporations, specifically um, in in different manufacturing uh, sectors, to develop more apprenticeship programs uh, similar to the the wonderful program here in, in Germany to uh, work with high schools and follow them through the university level so that they can leave their schooling and enter straight into a position. Um, the other piece we struggle with in relation to education is language access. Uh, English isn't the official language of the United States, although some people will tell you that, um, but uh, it's difficult to, prov to uh, for immigrants to get access to services in, in their native language. Um, and so that's part of the conversation now. As we had uh, budget talks, I asked every single director, what are you doing uh, to shift the culture within your department and really encourage multilingual ap um, applicants to apply as well as people that have an immigrant background and the answer across the board was oh that's a great idea we'll have to start thinking about that and I said I want to see your proposals and all of your budgets uh, <laughs> moving forward um, but it's still a very new conversation and and to no fault of their own people just because it hasn't been um, at the forefront and I think I may be the first uh, not the first Latina but the first person on council that has an immigrant background people haven't been having these conversations so a lot of it is, is we're just really planting the seeds thank you very much I would like to come now to a brief question to all of you about leadership. Um, we have a couple of very interesting questions from mayors from other cities, but I'm just gonna do a very brief round, if you would please, on leadership before we hear those questions because they also address leadership. And perhaps for each of you to focus on one particular area, possibly in the case of Mayor Schultz, also leadership within political parties, but feel free to speak to other aspects as well. But my question would be, what are you doing to harness leadership from all the different stakeholders in order to achieve concrete results in the area of migration and integration? I think leadership means that you have an idea about what to do, that you tell the people and that you try to get their support. And if you are very strict in what you uh, try to achieve, I think most people will follow you. So the most difficult thing is to be afraid, to be not very clear and not to speak about the necessities. So this is what I think is about leadership in the question. So when I addressed the people and said, we will welcome the, the people, we will do something uh, about education, we will do this naturalization campaign, we will have an agreement, not just with the uh, Protestant Church, the Catholic Church, with the Jewish community. We will also have an agreement out about cooperation with the Muslim co uh, community in Hamburg. Uh, the people accepted it. So it is something, if you have an, a way to address the people in and always speaking as the one who is uh, speaking in the terms of common sense, not as an extremist, a left or right wing or something like this, 
but as we do the, the things that are to do, is there anyone thinking a different attitude could be possible? And if you do it like this, it works. The roll up the sleeves attitude. Just briefly, if you would, please. Political parties, with your long career in the SPD, what role do you see for a political party? What can you do within the SPD to move this issue? I think uh, this would be not very true if I say, would say that it is necessary to move it because we have political positions which are very much in favor of it and they are not waiting for me to, to move, for, to change it. It's already done. So when I was uh, at my youth organization in the 80s, I organized a Congress on Immigration and it was the title Immigration Country Germany. This was the first time to do it then, but I think it was 1986 or something like this. So, um, and now it's nothing special. And uh, I think we have to be ready to discuss about things like this and we have to find careers of uh, migrants in our parties uh, which are not the outcome of a, a support by the leadership. So the first got some support by me and others. I asked them, could you be member of parliament, possibly? But now it's necessary that someone who was working on uh, childcare, who is uh, working on what can we do for the business in my district, is making it to become member of parliament and not because he is a migrant. This is necessary. If half of the young people in my, camp in my city is attending, attending schools are of migrant background, it is nothing special. So it must be normal, and this is the attitude necessary. Still, I think you are being a bit modest. You have played a significant role in mentoring some individuals who now have become faces for migration in political leadership positions. So let me now move on to Mayor Payunen, who has private sector management experience, and perhaps ask you to focus on leadership in terms of how do we constructively get the private sector on board. Khalid Koza gave us a few examples of not so constructive work with the private sector. Do you have some more positive ones? Yes, yeah, so if, if I start about the, the world leadership, which is a, a kind of a difficult thing when you're talking about a Nordic system where the mayors are just ordinary people with because we are very equal <laughs> societies. But I feel that uh, uh, that it is very important that the, the cities give signals. And in Helsinki we have uh, started uh, a few years ago a system where the city council decides a strategy for the city for four years. And it's very important that in the strategy of the city, there is a positive vision about the future regarding to the growth of the immigrant population. And also in the strategy, the tools must be very well defined, what we are going to do. And the second thing which is very important is that in, in the Nordic system, the responsibilities of the cities are huge. In the organization of the city of Helsinki, we have 40,000, more than 40,000 employees, which means that our own organization could be an excellent example showing the way for the whole society. And the third thing which, which you were asking about, how to, how to harness the different, different stakeholders, as, especially the, the private sector, to work together, is that uh, we, in, in Finland, we have a system and a habit of working together. It's very easy to build networks, not only with the, uh, the private sector, but for the higher education, for the state level with the city. And that's, that's the, 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 the great asset of our system, that we are, it's, it's easy to work together. And finally, one thing which is important, I feel, feel among the immigrant population that the mayor has a better status in, in the immigrant population and than in the basic population. <laughs> because very many <laughs> of them come from societies where the mayors are real, something next to the god. <laughs> it's not the system in our, in <laughs> Finland, but I like that they feel that I'm <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Ms. Castaneda Lopez, you were a fellow with the Center for Progressive Leaders and New Detroit Multicultural Leaders, and you recently completed the Transatlantic Inclusion Leadership Training with the German Marshall Fund. So if anybody here is qualified to give us a very <laughs> clear view on what leadership is and how to exercise it, you must be that person. Briefly, if you would, please, what are you doing within the council to harness leadership? Sure. Um, so what we did in forming the immigration task force was made sure that we tapped into the immigrant communities themselves and asked them to identify leaders. I think oftentimes uh, we create silos and even those of us who think we're very progressive and open-minded, um, we tend to tap into our own networks and we know that immigrant communities don't necessarily have access to the same social capital as some other more privileged communities. So it was really important for us to make sure that we identified um, some of the major groups within the city of Detroit and asked them to have leaders come to the table and and I think we have a diverse group uh, oftentimes uh, we think we define leadership in a certain way and it's people who have access to, to different political power or or very much in the United States the conversation I think is dominated uh, by the private sector and people who have a lot of economic capital um, but within some of the immigrant communities in the city of Detroit so Iraqi Yemeni Hmong um, uh, people from the Caribbean Mexican Americans um, they the, I th would say a large number of the immigrants actually in the city limits. And I keep clarifying that because people say Detroit and they may be from three hours away and they say that they're from Detroit and they live in one of the wealthiest suburbs in, in the state. Um, but that's very different from the reality in the city of Detroit. So immigrants in the city of Detroit, Detroit proper uh, face a different reality. Um, so it was. So we have a, a regular construction worker on the task force who doesn't necessarily have a college degree, but is a leader within the Hmong community of that tribe that he represents. Uh, we have representatives from the Bengali community, again, uh, from the religious sector, but people you wouldn't necessarily see at the table. And I think that's part of cultivating leadership um, is having people choose their own leaders so that they feel empowered, but also uh, bringing people to the table that have a different perspective and don't play, uh, traditionally wouldn't be seen as leaders, leaders and don't play the typical role, I, I guess, that we often use to define leaders. And, and part of bringing them to the table is sharing stories. Um, and so I, as a young person, as one of the, f the few women on this panel, but also uh, on my council, um, it, it, I think it's our role in identifying and really giving people those opportunities and bringing them to the table and, and mentoring them. So as part of the task force, all of our, our members are kind of charged with bringing people to the meetings and, and incorporating young leaders from their communities so that they can step up and play a, a role in the future. Thank you very much. So we do have two video questions. The first one is also about leadership. I'm going to ask you to just play both of them back to back, if you would, please, and then we'll do consolidated answers in hopes that we can still get a couple of audience questions in before we take a break. So please, could we have those two video questions? The first Hello, one. Hello, my name is Nahid yeah. Menchi, and I am the mayor of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Calgary is Canada's third largest city, its fastest growing major city, and one of the largest cities in terms of growth in the number of newcomers to our community. Partly this is due to a booming economy, but it also due to an attitude, an attitude of incredible welcoming of people from around the world to come here and to be able to succeed here. Certainly I'm proud of that as the son of immigrants myself, but I want to ask the members of the panel, and particularly my colleagues who have been affected by the European elections, how do great progressive policies at the city level, like the ones we have here, in government policy and programs offered by ourselves in nonprofit organizations, as well as in fostering an attitude around people of assisting migrants to live a great life. How do we take that leadership and translate it beyond the borders of our city so that we can help others become places of refuge and opportunity for newcomers? Thank you very much. So hold that thought, and now we're going to hear one more question, and then we'll take uh, consolidated answers. Hello, my name is Leanne Delzell. I'm the Mayor of Christchurch in New Zealand. As many of you will remember, we suffered a devastating earthquake back in 2011. The rebuild of Christchurch is now the real driver of economic growth in New Zealand. But we suffer a couple of problems. One is the question of skilled migrant shortages. We need skilled labour in particular areas. And we also have pressures on our housing. So how have other cities managed to cope with the short-term pressures that increased migration bring and the pressure on housing prices at the same time as managing for the long term? How have cities managed to deal with that issue? Very good. 
two very meaty questions there. Um, I'll ask you to try to give as concise answers as possible. So as I say, we can come to some audience questions. Mayor Schultz, how, do your, how can you move your leadership to other areas of government, to other levels of government, and short-term, long-term calibration? Very difficult. I think we have to discuss about things like those we discussed today. So this is part of the process. And uh, I think that many others are looking for what we are doing. So, and we are looking what others are doing. So that we are not that idle. Uh, but to say um, it's necessary to speak about it and to give the, the, the chance to, to understand it works. And I now I learned that many others, for instance, in Germany, are now looking for a naturalization campaign if they can do something similar because it works that much. And so if we do something successful, they will do it as well. Or if you, for instance, look at the nice film you can see in the marketplace in, in the Hamburg stand or something like this, you will understand why others want to do the same. So I think uh, an example and the discussing about it and showing that it works is the best thing. And the second question, short term, long term? The mayor of Christchurch had asked, they have a boom right now because of short term construction. But long term, it's harder to calibrate how much labor they're going to need. Any good recipes for how to get that balance right? I think that uh, it is. it will be not too difficult to be successful with labor and work in, in these booming cities because they have things like this and this is the case in Hamburg and other places. It's much more difficult if you are developing a strategy of uh, integrating in work in w when all the region is not in a good economic shape. So this is a different task. But there is a necessity for labor, for work, for skilled work and uh, they will come. I think the only thing we have to understand in Europe that one thing is different to the United States, for instance, because many parts of the social welfare system in the United States is on the national level. This would be as if the European Union would pay for social welfare questions. They are not. So we have completely different systems, and there are very rich economies like Finland and uh, Germany, for instance, who have a social welfare system which is middle class income in some of the member states of the United uh, of Europe. So it is necessary to understand that this is something where we will not have the American system of one social welfare construction and that we have to avoid mobility which is looking for social welfare. But it is not the main problem. It's something we have to look at. Thank you very much. Mayor Payunen, um, leadership from municipal level how do you spread those good ideas? You've mentioned to us several times that you're here to learn. Do you have some thoughts about how to get the ideas out and then also the short-term, long-term phenomenon? I, I, I would like to, uh, or, 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 or what I'm thinking about now is that, that uh, I feel that in, in Helsinki, we have a reci recipe for a great success story. And uh, I partly answer also the long term, short term. We have the aging population, the Nordic, wel Nordic welfare system, uh, people getting old. Uh, all the people are uh, using a lot of, uh, especially healthcare services. And then we have a fast growing immigrant population, people with, who are mostly at their best working age. And if we are able to work inside Finland with the state level, with all the stakeholders, in such a way that we solve the problem of unemployment. Different tools for that. One, one tool, for example, is, is uh, using the entrepreneurship, the possibilities of entrepreneurship which for which we have a program. And in that case, the growing population, the dynamic economy, more work from workforce from the immigrant population, and that's the success story of, of the future. The only problem with us is that we, as, as it today very well was stated, we know, we know the problem, we they need the tools which are working. And the problem doesn't com come from the Im immigrant population, it comes from ourselves, our, uh, the, the system for employment is too slow, it's too, too complicated, 
and if there are too many uh, parties taking part in into that in order to make it an entity and that's what i'm trying to do then other 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 things what are happening for example the one concept of the city of helsinki is that we want to be un fun and functional functional is of course the what we are what we are we are feel that we everything functions in the society well but the fun part is a bit <laughs> difficult for <laughs> Finn because uh, you know know that uh, we are, I'm not an engineer, so I, I may use that in, in, a, in a way engineer minded that we everything functions, but the fun it's it's something which <laughs> doesn't you don't show anybody. But the immigrant population is the best source of, of fun for the society. They are they like to be outside, they are they 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 they, they are together with people and, and, and if you compare the city of Helsinki of nineteen ninety and today it's it is the, what you see in, in, in Helsinki, it's totally different. And one great reason for this is that we are m more multicultural. Thank you. You wanted to make a comment, <laughs> fun and functional? No, not on fun. <laughs> I'm from Hamburg. <laughs> this is uh, not so far from Helsinki. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I w just want to mention one question which is already raised uh, even in your statement now. It is the question about skills. I think we have to understand that the labor market, especially in Northern Europe and in Middle Europe, is completely different to the labor market, market many people who are migrating expect. So we, yeah. to make it v to a very short point, there is no u request for unskilled labor. We need skilled labor and only this. Uh, I have, uh, we had made a research that in the coming labor market of the city of Hamburg, 5% of the whole labor market is reserved to unskilled labor. And we have today in Germany already 20% of the population becoming 30, which is unskilled. So we have all a, a lot of problems already to solve, but those coming from far away, expecting it is a good chance like it has been in the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s, to, to just to be a strong man, a strong woman, being busy and doing anything you are asked to, it won't be enough because we just we have a completely changed labor market and there is no need for unskilled labor. And this is the biggest question. And so we also have to do many things about qualification and professional and vocational training. This is one part of our programs. I don't want to speak about it now, but this is we have to, to, to learn and to understand when we think about migration. This is why one of the sentences on your very good website is Bildungspolitik ist Integrationspolitik, that they are, yes. So, um, Ms. Castaneda Lopez, if you would please also briefly address those questions, long-term versus short-term, and also what can, how do cities get the message out once they've found a good solution? I just wanted to follow up, but I think it's really interesting to think of, again, how do we define skilled labor and how do we define unskilled labor? Um, because I would argue that there is a need for this quote unquote unskilled labor force. Um, and it's just how we define that and how we value that as a society. So in terms of, thank you. In terms of the city of Detroit, um, Unfortunately, following the trends of some of the other larger cities in terms of attracting the creative class um, and, and uh, building big arenas in, in up our downtowns to attract these people from the outside of the city of Detroit um, in attracting supposedly skilled labor. But I would argue that it's really the large uh, population in the city of Detroit would be defined as unskilled. I, I represent one of the poorest parts of the city of Detroit, has the highest high school dropout rate, um, but also has the highest immigrant population. So again, these are people that come from Mexico or other places with elementary educations but are, are able to open up their own businesses and employ uh, Detroiters um, and, and to live successful lives in, in the city so in terms of, uh, of managing kind of the labor force, I think it's really about diversifying our economy, uh, specifically in the city of Detroit, moving w away from being solely an industrial city to thinking about how we support uh, fields that have a spectrum of skills, like the education sector as well as the medical sector. So a good example is Henry Ford Hospital in the city of Detroit, and you think uh, they employ people, uh, janitors, right, as well as physicians that, have, that are doctors. And that's a broad range of skill set that I think is more inclusive and encompasses some of the skilled as well as unskilled trades uh, according to uh, 
traditional definitions. So that's a way uh, to think about it. What, uh, what uh, economies and what industries are we supporting? Um, in terms of, I think, spreading best practices, uh, I think conferences like these, um, we adopted a lot of our, our initiatives, our strategic plan for our immigration task force from the city of New York. They have a really great website and from the city mm -hmm. of Dayton, uh, we are going to be joining the Welcoming America initiative and I know there's someone here from that office today, uh, which is a, a national program to, to support cities in becoming more welcoming toward, toward immigrant communities. So I think uh, joining networks such as those, um, but uh, also uh, sharing best practices, I think, especially for the city of Detroit, we have so much negative attention. Sometimes you think everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so reaching out to get to support from other areas, and but challenging the media to shift those, to shift the narratives, and sharing your successful stories, I think, is part of, um, part of the, the solution as well. Thank you very much. We are quite tight on time, but I would like to take two audience questions. We're going to bundle them. We have one over here, and I'm going to take one over here in the middle. And I'm afraid that's probably all we're going to manage. But we have a coffee break, and so you can keep discussing during the break. Here, please, this lady. Go ahead. And here. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I'm a doctoral research uh, researcher in the University of Hamburg. Uh, um, and my question is directed towards Olaf Scholz. Um, so my, th my thesis very briefly is about uh, collective decision-making processes and migrants being included in those collective decision-making processes and how that affects their behavior um, within society, um, their commitment to that society. And um, so there are lots of different ways of how to include short, migrants. Short, 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 please. I'm yeah. sorry, but... <laughs> um, so what I, want to, what I want to ask you is, right as for now, 4% of people who are in po political roles, 5% of people who are teachers in Germany are migrants. Olaf Scholz, I would like to ask you, do you think that uh, we should include migrants more in, in those roles, in those decision-making roles, and how would you want to, to achieve that? Do you have any ideas? Thank you very much. I'm going to bundle the questions, so I had one more here. Hi there. Go ahead. It's on? Okay. I'm a journalist for a German magazine, Public Forum, and I also have a question towards Olaf Scholz concerning the naturalization process. I didn't quite understand the importance of it, because in my impression, if you are black or Arab looking or you wear a headscarf in Germany, you are still seen as a foreigner. And I think it doesn't make, it, like people don't ask what's written in your passport. Okay, thank you. And to not prejudice uh, the men, I'm going to take one more question here, this gentleman in the striped shirt. So we do have one. <laughs> Amitabh Kundu, I teach economics in New Delhi. See, I'm really overwhelmed by uh, and impressed by this pro-migration strategies that have been talked about by the uh, mayor of Hamburg, Helsinki, and the representative from uh, Detroit. But you know, uh, also I, I was very impressed to hear that the cities are building bridges again, while the states are trying to build the walls we must realize that there are a large number of cities which are becoming exclusionary. And this question comes because if you look at the data, projection was made that by 2006, world urban population will be 50%. It took three years extra, basically because there has been a slowing down of migration and urbanization in the whole world. And if you take 10 million plus cities and 5 million plus cities, the world urbanization prospect says that the growth rate has declined in these cities compared to the smaller order towns less than 5 million. So I just wanted to, I just question, wanted to the yeah. question is that what kind of message should I take to the Asian countries where cities are exclusionary and also a large number of other cities in Europe are also exclusionary. What kind of message should you like to give to those cities and their administrators? Thank, Thank you. you very much. So we'll start with uh, Mayor Schultz with the first two questions and if you care to uh, briefly address that one as well. So I think participation is uh, of big importance. This is why I request many people to, to be successful in the political parties, to take part in the process of democracy in our country. And that means that I'm, I think, asking them to get the German citizenship if they don't have it. And we are quite successful with it. As you know, they're now uh, Minister of Integration in, in, in Germany, is, uh, has been member of the Hamburg Parliament and she started her political career because I asked her to do so uh, and, uh, and run for parliament as, uh, for the Social Democratic Party when she was not in it. Uh, and she did so, and I think it was something that gave many others the idea to do the same, and you find them all over. If you look at the local districts, there are really uh, successful young men and women and older ones who are integrated in all these processes, and 
something really changed anyone is thinking about it very, very much as a normal uh, situation. And we had now a communal election, uh, which is the first time in Hamburg, and we don't know if we will continue with this because we have another tradition. But uh, it was in the regional parts, and then some hundred uh, people's faces were on the streets. And if you look at them, you will find a lot of migrants in between. And this was really a change because uh, you could see how many people are really involved in political processes. We have a campaign of asking migrants to go to the public services. Uh, and we, we, we are quite successful in the last years. And they, they, they are doing more and more. And, it is, and we, we started to ask them. This is something we have to do by, um, uh, freely without the obligation, because in Germany we have a different system in the, as in the United States. So no one would say, I'm in fourth generation Greek American. Uh, and there is no counting about it. So when I was mm. Minister of Labor, we started with counting, and we do now in Hamburg with the public service, but we'd ask them if they are ready to, to take part in a sort of poll about the question, because there is no official registration. It, and, and, and if anyone is naturalized, we don't we won't have foreigners in our in our statistics because they are not registered as this. And I think mm -hmm. it's a good tendency to yeah, have yeah. it like this. So this was the first question. We encourage people to do so and to do it in the public service, in the democracy. And I think this will have effects on, on our society. The second question was about... Has naturalization really made a difference in attitudes? The yes. young lady pointed out that um, all over Germany, people are identified in terms of how they look. Yeah, but the things are changing. I think uh, if you look at the popular people now in, in, our, in, in cinema, for instance, very famous ones are now of a migrant background and no one ex is, is especially telling it. And uh, if you look at, uh, at many other uh, places, I think it is nothing where we are all, we should sit together in a way of, of a holy ceremony in a church and now we say we never, look at different faces, we are all the same. It's something happened because the people get accustomed to it, and this is what is going on. I think no one is making a special point about it, and this is how it should work. And the last question about um, Also about attitudes, and basically, how do you get the message out to so many cities in the world that are not pursuing inclusiveness, but exclusiveness? Yeah, I think it is necessary that we are open-minded. I think it will be more easy in harbor cities like mine because they are always, they had well be connected to the rest of the world for centuries and they are used to it. In other places, they get have to get used. And we have to follow, uh, we, we have to oppose the idea of that now we are, there is nothing to, to change anymore. So I'm very much in favor that you always discuss a little bit critical about Richard Florida's about, uh, idea about the creative class. I understood it like this, because it was always as there is no one working in a big factory, if there is no one cleaning the streets, and this is nice guys we have in our cities. And so we had, have to look for anyone to come. And this is, aside from the question of education and getting skills, the question of building. And I think there is some tendencies in some places in the world why they restrict their apartment and building policy to the middle class. And you will find big cities where there is no poor people living. And this mm -hmm. is a mistake. If you are a place of hope, if you are a city of hope, you must be open to those who want to become middle class, but who are not when they attend at your place. And this is, I think, of big importance that we see the things like this. Thank you very much. So I will ask uh, Mayor Payunen and uh, Ms. Castaneda Lopez to also give us a brief answer, perhaps focused on that third question, which in a way recapitulates the question we had heard from the mayor of Calgary. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm not here to teach anybody. I'm, I'm learning and trying yeah. to benchmark what others are doing and, and the best, best practices, of course. Um, Equality is something which is very traditional for the Nordic societies. And, and uh, I, I would like to stress also the, uh, what is said here already, that where there the immigrant population is the largest, the, the, op, uh, the, the positives are mostly positive. In, in it's the case in Helsinki also that, that uh, 
the popular support of, of uh, parties or fractions of parties which are against the immigrant pop population in, in their programs, it's lowest in, lowest in Helsinki where the part of the population is highest. So to show the example, learn from each other, uh, I would like to say that I'm, I'm impressed about the practices which are used in, in, in North America, especially Canada. There, there are very excellent things they are doing, which I, I would like to use in, in Helsinki to show that everybody is a member of, ev everybody is a Helsinki people when they come. We build the society together. We have the uh, a common future. And remembering that, that uh, in, 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 in future, challenges are more global, cities are bigger, as said in here. And in a way, try to do your best, learn from the e each other, and uh, show the example that uh, exclusion is not the solution. It's something from the from the history which we we, do, we won't want to con don't want to continue. So I think uh, part of the solution is identifying the problem as it is. So in the United States, there's been, I think, a uh, large deinvestment in urban areas, both at the federal as well as many of the state levels. And I think that's really due to racialized politics. And we don't like to talk about it in those terms. A lot of people think we're in a post-racial era since we elected Obama, and I, and I can see that to a certain extent. <laughs> but at the same time, that's not the reality. So as urban areas become more diverse, more colored communities, there's been a, a deinvestment in terms of funding and support for these urban communities. Um, and so, so the first question I think addressed uh, immigrant involvement in terms of the education system. If you think, uh, and I apologize if I talk fast, but you th within the education system, <laughs> um, it really is a foundation for, for teaching culture, right, in our history. So if you have a lot of immigrants uh, that may not really understand uh, your, uh, your history and your, and your culture, um, that's a scary thing to think about them teaching you the next generation. So I think to a certain extent, um, we talk about integration and, and being diverse, inclusive societies, but at the same time, institutionally, there, there's built in um, discrimination uh, in relation to uh, being a visibly uh, ethnic minority. Um it is difficult. I was born and raised in the United States. Uh, I live right next to the Canada border. In five minutes, I could walk across the bridge. And, and in in my community, which is highly immigrant, you have lots of uh, patrolling by the uh, Border Patrol and, and ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement. And I was running down the street one day, and Border Patrol decided to follow me down the street. And and if I was blonde hair and blue eye, I may not have been followed down the street. And so regardless of being a, a citizen of, of a certain country, uh, your, your physical characteristics, um, unfortunately, uh, it, it do lead to more discrimination. So I do think it's important to have these symbolic celebrations uh, and people do enjoy um, and get excited about new uh, immigrants becoming American citizens. But at the same time, I think it's important to recognize the reality um, that we do live in discriminatory uh, societies and that, that needs to be addressed. Um, <coughs> And, and I think part of that, uh, the last question addressed exclusionary cities, part of that is, rec again, recognizing where we are and then moving forward uh, by sharing stories. I'm a big advocate uh, of storytelling. So Detroit is one of the most racially segregated cities in, in the United States. Um, a lot of people talk about 8 Mile, if you listen to Eminem, the rapper, it's at the border of the city of Detroit. Um, but there is very clear racial divides. The district that I represent, it has 40% Latinos, 40% African American, 20% Caucasians. And you can geographically see where the Latino community lives, where the African American community lives, and where the white community lives, uh, you literally just cross the street in some neighborhoods. And so I think part of helping us move beyond these geographical and, and these mental kind of divides and overcome our fear is through sharing stories. So part of our initiative in is, is encompassing these series of house talks, if you so to speak, kind of focus groups, where uh, one set targeted towards the immigrant community and really listening to their, to their concerns and what they need um, and what uh, challenges they face, but the other set uh, working with the non-immigrant community community and asking them, what does it mean to be a Detroiter? How do we move forward in terms of becoming a more diverse, inclusive global city? What does that look like? And identifying the common values, which I, I think there are common values, and really uh, using a, a marketing strategy to kind of come up with a brand, so to speak, for the city of Detroit. And highlighting the individual stories of how people came to the city of Detroit, both people from other countries, as well as migrants from all over. Um, during Detroit's peak, we had a lot of people coming up from the south. So Detroit has, a, a, I think, a unique history in that way. Um, but identifying individual stories to really create this larger narrative and recognize that we, we have similar struggles and, and that really they're not that different. Um, so how do we I, kind of profile individual Detroiters to create a larger narrative as to what it means to be a Detroiter uh, in terms of inclusivity and, and diversity. Thank you very much. And <laughs> thanks.
thanks to you for sharing your story at such high speed that we're only a little bit late going to the break. I would like to thank all of the panelists. It seems to me that we already achieved Ratna's objective of having a number of very, very concrete practices and ideas that we can all take with us. So I'm just deeply grateful to all three of you for being here and for promoting such productive exchange. Yes. Thank, 